Well, you've come into my den of yelling on your own accord. Welcome to everything I have been building up inside for the past 2020. You thought a new year knew me? No, you fool. You thought you escaped 2020? No, because I'm about to grab you by your throat, drag you back into the mess as we talk about the best messes I read in 2020 and the worst ones I read in 2020. It's a final end of the year list. Gonna be Hi! What is up you guys? It's me, your girl, your Casey. I don't even want to do intros anymore. Let's just get into this jazz. But wait, I think I need some earrings. My ears are kind of playing about it. Oops. So, I found some favorite books this year. Not this year, 2020 year. And I found some ones that makes me want to rip out a chainsaw and do some little slashing and tearing. So, it's time to tell you what's the best of the best and the worst of the worst. Here's how this list is going to go. You saw last year's, well technically two years ago now, Gosh, I'm old. I saw two years ago the 2019 list, then it's the same format. We're gonna start with the fifth worst, then we're gonna go to the fifth best, fourth worst, fourth best, and so on up the list till we get to numero uno. Numero uno, in both of these categories, best and worst, has a special place in my body. One has my heart, the other one has like the bile in my stomach, I guess. Tell me what you hated this year, because I'm about to tell you the one I hated least this year, but still enough to put on the shelf. It is number five, Ignite Me by Tahara Mafi, book three of the Shatter Me series. This book honestly failed in every way that a finale at the time could have failed. If you guys do not know, Shatter Me originally was a trilogy. It was very popular. I myself feel kind of meh about it, except for one character. That character was Bauman. And I actually didn't like our main girl, Juliet, a lot. We are in this, honestly, it's the most typical dystopian book out there. Oh, global warming is happening. The climate and the surface are changing. The human population is like thinning out, but then the government collapses and then this new like worldwide government rises from the ashes. Oh, but all the icky stuff happening from the wars and the climate change has created these mutant peoples. These mutant peoples are put to death. But oh, what ho, our, our main protector She's one of these crazy mutant peoples. Our girl Juliet, who I actually didn't like, she has this mutant ability of lethal touch. Like if she touches you, you're gonna feel extreme pain for like five seconds, then you're gonna die. So she has been ripped away from her family, or maybe even her family actually gave her away voluntarily, I can't remember, but she's basically been living, I think, a year in basically a cell, like one of those padded loony cells. And what I did enjoy that first book a lot, the series honestly got worse and worse as it progressed. It had very bad, see, <laughs> When I try to describe this book, I'm all, <gasps> the characters were great, but they were like really shallow, like no backstories, like they are the most perfect temperature baby pools out there. You'll love them, but would you die for them? No. Except Warner. You love Warner in this house. But anyways, it was a Shatter Me, the series was originally a trilogy. One, two, three books. Shatter Me, Unravel Me, and Ignite Me. Ignite Me was bad. That's where the trilogy ended off. But then, years later, Tahara Mafi decided to bring back the series with three more other books. I have not touched those books. I don't really plan to, unless they're at my library. But however, if I was one of those original fans who thought that the series ended on those first three books, I would have been mad. It had like one of the most anticlimactic endings ever. I know we had to board a boat and it was literally the easiest thing ever for like 80% of the time. Then there was only like one guard who had a pretty good power, but we beat him up really quickly too. We beat up the bad guy and we literally just walk off into this military compound, I guess, and everybody reunites and that's it. It was lame. And this book had like great romantic moments, but that ending was just like, meh. Will we even care about each other? Let's just end this mess. The Shadow Me series did have good moments, just not that third book. Not good. You do need to read it for Warner's sake. But now we're gonna forget about the bad and we're gonna go to the best. Well, not the best, one of the best, the least of the best. But still pretty great. It is Ninth House by Leigh Bardugo. I had to put this on this list because me and this book had a weird relationship way back in January of 2020 when we thought the world was burgeoning with hope and love. I got this book from the library and you know, I thought the Grisha trilogy was pretty meh except for the Darkling. We love the Darkling in this house. 
I love Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. We love Kaz Brecker in this house. King of Scars makes me so mad. So Leigh Mardugo is honestly my wild card author. I can't trust her, but I'm also too scared to not read her things. But the ninth house came out. I read like the first hundred pages and I hated it. So I just like threw it aside. I had other library books to read. Then I returned them all back to the library. But then I was like, oh, why did I let it go? I should have finished that book so I could do a nice little rant review. Review? Real French today on three. I wanted to do a rant review on it. I had already made up a title in my mind for the video. Ninth house, more like the ninth circle of hell. So I reordered the library book, reread it, and loved it this time. I love this book. <laughs> Ninth House is about the magical societies that are, oh, I can't remember what college it was. Let's just say Harvard. It is about the magical societies that exist within Harvard. All the different magical sets like reanimation, potion making, illusion, all the really fun magical stuff. Uh, even like transformations. And our girl, I believe her name was Alex. She is like introduced to this world. She has her mentor whose name is Darlington. Darlington is a darling. We love Darlington in this house. But then a great murder happens on the grounds of Hardbird and it's up to our girl Alex and Darlington to figure out what's going on and why is she also like attracting all these ghosts around her as we also unravel the mysteries of her very hush hush past and how Hardbird managed to pick up this past druggy high school dropout and bring her over across the country to the most prestigious college of all. I like it. <laughs> Learning about like what, I think it's like nine sets. Yeah, because it's the ninth house. And Alex is part of the ninth house, which is which is kind of like the peacekeepers of the other eighth houses. The police, they like make sure, don't you go changing librarians and the rabbits now, you hear? Seeing like how the societies worked and how they did their magic was very interesting. Only thing that wasn't as cool, in my opinion, was the murder mystery aspects of it. However, it ended off unforgivably, and I need to know what happens next, and I want the second book, which has my endorsement. Number four of the worst of the worst. We have Kingdom of Gods by N. K. Jemison, lady who wrote the fifth season, wrote, I honestly don't care enough about this book series to remember it, but it's called The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms. This, again, was book three of this series. Notice the trend? None of these bad books are nailing the endings. So book one of the Hundred Thousand Kingdoms series is about our girl Yin. She is the basically the duchess of one of these small, poverty-stricken countries amidst a hundred thousand kingdoms, all ruled by this big emperor guy. Yin one day gets a summons to go see the emperor. She does, and he reveals that he's her granddad. And he's like, yeah, now you have to stay in my castle forever. <laughs> Yin does not want to, but she has to because he's big emperor and she's from tiny country. He might attack tiny country if she makes him mad. Also, she knows from like hints of her past and little memories that granddad probably killed off her mom or something like that. There's secrets in this castle and she's also determined to ring them out too. But she has to tread very carefully because the emperor guy is super powerful because he has like all the gods on the little leash and if anyone makes him mad he'll just throw a bucket load of gods on people and obliterate them off the map. So this book is just walking around the castle, finding clues, talking to the cool gods. It was meh. The second book though, which I can't get into a lot of details at all, has a newer cast, and I actually like that one a lot more. I gave that one four stars. So first book was three stars, second book was four, third book did not need to exist. It's like a two star. It starred um the childhood god, like he's the god of childhood and innocence, who was originally one of my favorite characters. I now despise him. This third book, Kingdom of God, is literally a short story stretched out to like 400 pages. Nothing of consequence, ending did not make sense, and also, bear, incest. Cause you know, those, those cousins are, and those sisters are they're just too hot to handle, oh my gosh. This book did give me some backstories on one of the more angstier characters from the first book, which I approved of wholeheartedly, but we should have just like booted out Childhood God and his ridiculous storyline and just stuck with Mr. Broody God. I like Broody God. We approve of Broody God in this 
household. The fourth best book of 2020 was a thriller that I usually think about at least three times a week, so it made like a little mark on my heart, I guess. It is called Escape Room. The summary on the back of the book does not tell you what you need to know about the book, so I'm gonna tell you what it's about. First off, the book, this book, it starts out with this janitor guy, you know, just sweeping around, mopping up the trash. You don't mop up trash, don't do that. But he starts hearing like these banging sounds in the elevator shaft, just boom, boom, boom. And so he runs up to the elevator, he's like, hey there, uh, what's going on? Why won't these doors open? But then doors do open and it reveals a man still standing over the bodies of three of his friends holding a smoking gun in his hand. Then we go backwards through time. Now we are in the perspective of our girl Jules, who's, you know, she just graduated college. She's like, if I do not get a job immediately, no one will ever hire me. I relate. But she manages to impress the big wig, the head honcho of one of the finest businesses in her city. One of the men, you will learn, who is in that elevator. So this is about our girl's climb through the business world, how she's balanced balancing business, relationships, and just the overwhelming misogyny of the business workplace. But we make some fantastic friends along the way, make some jerks, and you know, we just proceed to get stabbed in the back a few hundred times. In our girl Jules's point of view, that's only like every other chapter of the book. The other chapters are about four, those four elevator people, before the big gun scene. It's them getting like taken up to this office because the head 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 honcho was like, someone has been performing well, we're gonna put you guys through an escape room scenario for some team building. These four people, they're like in an alliance with each other, but they're also like skeptical of each other. But as they're going up an elevator on the way to their meeting slash escape room, they guess the elevator gets stuck. And then the real escape room begins. And it's interesting seeing how these two stories like interconnect with each other. Also, this was a really good thriller. So I love thrillers, so I love that. I love the main character. I love the friend that she made, whose name I cannot remember, and that is a great injustice, but let's call her Pearl. Pearl was a pearl. We love pearls in this household. It had such a satisfying conclusion, but it left one little teensy winksy thing open where I was like, I want a sequel. Write it. Honestly, if you want to start out with a really good thriller read, because you're not typically a thriller reader, go do it. Oh, I locked you in an escape room myself with me. The third worst book of 2020 was a major disappointment, a major kick to my childhood. It was literally like tearing my heart in half. It is To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini. Oh, that name sounds familiar? It's because he wrote the greatest book of all time. It's called Eldest. Go read it. I have a rent review already posted. Go watch it. Shortened version is this. Mary Sue character. Cringy, horrible dialogue. Ugh, poorly done, like a quirky sense of humor. None of the characters were likable, except the characters that weren't human. Like, there was a mad ship named Grigorovich. He was lovely, because he was insane. The overall plot and adventure of this sci-fi was literally all over the place. Like, you know a target, and the target has bullet holes? Christopher Palin must just have been like, boom, 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 boom. If it lands, it lands. This book is about Kira. Not the cool Death Note Kira. This is the lame Kira. This is the Diet Coke Kira. This is, you know, well, rice cake Kira. Kira is a xenobiologist out there exploring the great yonder of outer space. She's on this planet with her boyfriend. Let's call him Alan. His name's probably Alan, but I'm, I don't really know. They're about to finish up on their great expedition, but Kira's like, oh, me and Alan will have to part because we're not married and he's gonna get sent on a whole different assignment. But then Alan's like, no, my love, marry me. Oh. So now Kira is over the moon about her marriage to the Mr. Alan. But then this one other scientist runs up and he's like, yeah, Kira, we had a drone that crashed, you know, a couple clicks that way. Can you go check it out, please? So Kira does, she checks out the drone, she puts her hand on a rock or something, she falls through the rock and she lands in this weird alien altar. There's something in the alien altar, she touches it and it starts crawling up her and then she blacks out. So by now, after all I just told you, we're in chapter four. Chapter four was the best chapter because it had mass murder of every character I hated, except Kira. And then the rest of the book was very, very boring. Uh, it was the main characters that knocked me out of this story completely. Also, 
There were some cameos from the Aragon series that literally broke my heart because I was like, you do not deserve to be in this mess. They will ruin you. If you want a good sci-fi, read Skyward by Brandon Sanderson. Honestly, the romance in that one isn't that great too, but Spins is hilarious. She reminds me of me. She's the type of person who'll just jump on top of a lunch table and point at someone and be like, battle me to the death, bro. And I respect that. We respect battling people to the death in this house. Speaking of Brandon Sanderson, okay, our third best book is a tie. Same series. I couldn't decide which one I liked better. We have Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson and Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson. Please do not make me describe what this book series is about. It's very hard. So I'm gonna get on the good reads and pull up this mess. Oh my gosh, even the summary is long. Okay, let me get my nice orator voice. Roshar is a world of stone and storms. Uncanny tempest of incredible power sweeps across the rocky terrain so frequently that they have shaped ecology and civilizational life. Animals hide in shells, trees pull in branches, and grass retracts into the soilless ground. Cities are built only where the topography offers shelter. It has been centuries since the fall of the ten concentrated orders known as the Knights Radiant, but their shard blades and shard plate remain. Mystical swords and suits of armor that transform ordinary men into near invincible warriors. Men tread kingdoms for shard blades, wars were fought for them and won by them. One such war rages on the ruined landscape called the Shattered Plain. There, Kaladin, insert fangirl scream, Kaladin, freaking Kaladin Stormblast, who traded his medical apprenticeship for a spear to protect his little brother, has been reduced to slavery in a war that makes no sense, where ten armies fight separately against a single foe, he struggles to save his men and to fathom leaders who consider them expendable. Bright Lord Dalinor Colon commands one of these other armies. Like his brother, the late king, he is fascinated by an ancient text called the Way of Kings. Troubled by overpowering visions of ancient times in the Night's Radiant, he has begun to doubt his own sanity. And in this book, like the whole idea of visions is very sacrilegious, so he can't really tell anyone about it, so they just think he's going mad because when he has these visions, he just collapses and spazzes on the floor. Across the ocean, I'm probably picking up because I'm telling you like three different characters right now. There's a ton of characters in this book with my only one thing with Brandon Sanderson. I'm like, dude, chill. You have enough. Across the ocean, an untried young woman named Shaylin seeks to train under an eminent scholar and notorious heretic, Dalinar's niece, Jasna. Though she genuinely loves learning, Shaylin's motives are less than pure. As she plans a daring theft, her research for Jasna hints at secrets of the Knights Radiant and the true cause of the war. The true enemy? Nice. I'm not done yet. The result of over 10 years of planning, writing, and world building, The Way of Kings is but the opening movement of the Stormlight Archive, a bold masterpiece in the making. Speak again the ancient oaths. Life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. In return to mend the shards they once bore, the Knights of Radiance must stand again. Did my light just die? Hey, turn back on, light. Why are you dying like that? Rude. Did you get all that? I went into this knowing nothing. That's honestly how you should go into it. <laughs> just know it's fantasy. It's great. The characters are awesome. Kaladin is the best one. Dalinar is my second. The big evil guy, who I won't tell you about. He's dope. I like him. I have literally nothing bad to say about Way of Kings or Words of Radiance. Way of Kings is the first book. Words of Radiance is the second one. I was a bit med by the third one, Oathbringer. Have not read Rhythm of War yet, which is the fourth one. One day I will. And yes, these are humongous books, but you would love them. For instance, it's very good with dealing with like inner turmoil. Except with like one character in the third book. You know who she is. But if you got time to read over a thousand page book, definitely pick up Way of Kings, give Kaladin a hug, but don't you dare kiss him, he's my bow. Okay, now we're getting to the runner-ups. The second of the worst is called The Devil Walks in a matching way. Right there. Go look at it. Really angsty cover, don't you think? Maybe some like small town murders or something like that? Not really. Whenever I try to think about what this book is about, all I see is a really fat country cop sitting on a rocking chair. That is honestly it. And again, I am pulling up Goodreads because this book was dumb. Okay, prepare yourself. It has been 20 years since Philip McBride's body was found along the riverbank in the darkened woods known as Happy Hollow. His death was ruled a suicide, but three people have carried the truth ever since. Philip didn't kill himself that day, he was murdered. Each of the three have wilted in the shadow of their sins. Jake Barnett is Mattingly's sheriff, where he spends his days polishing the fragile shell of a man he pretends to be. His wife, Kate, has convinced herself the good she does for the poor will someday wash the blood from her hands. And high 
the mountains, Taylor Hathcock lives in seclusion and fear, fueled by madness and hatred. Yet what cannot be laid to rest is bound to rise again. Philip McBride has haunted Jake's dreams for weeks, warning that he is coming back for them all. When Taylor finds mysterious footprints leading from the hollow, he believes his redemption has come. His actions will plunge the quiet town of Mattingly into darkness. These three will be drawn together for a final confrontation between life and death, between truth and lies. My light died again. It literally had a fresh battery. The devil walks in Mattingly, recalls Flannery O'Connor with its glimpses of the grotesque and supernatural. That's a laugh. This was neither grotesque or no true. Neutral? It was neutered. That's what it was. This was neither grotesque or supernatural. You know that ghost Philip McBride? He is barely in it. He was the best thing. He was never in it. And when I say he's the best thing, he's like 30 out of 100 best. <sighs> The thing that really made me mad about this book was the way it was written. It had the most pointless, flowery prose. It was trying to be something amazing. It was not. It just took a long time for anything of importance to be said. This book also described characters very weirdly. Like, everyone in this book is filthy. The author cannot stop talking about people's fat rolls. Characters like actively drool when they see something amazing. Again, that prose, let me just read you the prologue. She knows I must come to this place. It is my duty both as sheriff and as a barnet, and yet even as I hold my name and station in the highest regard, that is not why I dare enter this wood and strike east and north for the grove. I come to this place of darkness because it is where the light of heaven once touched. I come here for the ones who were saved on a night long ago and for the ones lost. I come because heaven is not without the past. What remains now is the long walk back through a forest empty of what life a man's eyes can see, but filled with what a man's eyes cannot. But I pause here nonetheless, as I remember, as I always do, and stand facing the whole. I do this as I may remember, so I remember true. Such is my burden still, the wounds I carry are not unlike the hollow, or the bear, or even this hole in front of me. They may lie hidden, but they are always there. And then he talks about how the ghost will come back to kill him. I hope he does one day. There is no action in this book. You, you know, that ghost was pretty pretty heavily prevalent in that summary, but he's not prevalent in the book. He shows that like three times, very spaced out. The sheriff is like so wrapped up in his woes and whatnot that he's literally a shell. And you cannot get attached to a shell like this. Like, he's just boring. The only plot I can think this book had in the beginning was uh, that Taylor guy who's like a real hillbilly type, he's looking for something can't remember what it was, but he causes a stir in the town, some paper gets published, like basically condemning the town to, I don't even remember, what, like these people got so upset about this newspaper that I just like wrecked the town. Maybe it was just blaming him for the murder-suicide of that boy, Philip. But none of these people were logical or made sense. And it was just so boring. And also this book, it says very clearly on the back that it's Christian fiction. The dude Jesus was not even mentioned in this thing, like rarely. Like people say swear on a Bible, uh, oh my god, stuff like that, does that make it Christian? So I don't even think this book knew what it was trying to be. Is this a Christian message? Is this a mess? Message? Mess? Conspiracy confirmed? And the reason why this boy Philip was like so upset he apparently killed himself is ridiculous. Because the reason why he's so upset is tied into why Mr. Hillbilly Taylor Hathcock is so upset. And it was so dumb. My like, bro, literally get over it. <laughs> okay, and the second best book of 2020 won my heart. I mean, it's honestly probably much better even than the number one spot on this list, but number one has a special place in my heart. But the second book is Red Rising by Pierce Brown. Oh my gosh, I love this book so much. So I really like science fiction. I'm trying to get into it, but after you read To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, you don't want to read science fiction anymore. It's a genre killer. Anyways, Red Rising is about our guy, Darrow. Darrow, he is classified as a red in the hierarchy of this civilization that has expanded out into Mars, basically. The reds, they're at the bottom of the tier. Highest is the golds. The golds are the masters, the reds are basically the slaves. Now Darrow and his whole like red city, they live under the surface of Mars. They're drilling down into it so they can eventually like terraform the earth, no, not the earth, so they can terraform Mars into becoming like a second earth. So. Darrow is actually proud of his heritage. He's like, oh, I'm doing this for the betterment of humanity and stuff like that. But then a little uh-oh happened and all the lies shatter. And so Darrow is now fueled with a burning hot flame inside of him and he is dedicated to toppling the gold government 
to do this, he has to become a gold. There are so many characters I love in this series. I've actually not finished the series yet. I've read Red Rising, I read Golden Sun, and a lot of people just have my heart. Darrow is just an amazing character who's been through so much. He is so intelligent. He's a great strategist. He's a fantastic fighter. And the real draw of this book is the friendship and the betrayals. Like, you make friends with someone, they can betray you quicker than your most shady alliances. You don't know who to trust at all in this book series. The people you are sure is about to turn on you actually turn out to be like your best friends. It was honestly so much fun. My only complaint about this book was that sometimes it got a little bit too over descriptive during action sequences. Well, not like the action itself, but it would like pause to tell you like the exact shape of a skyscraper or something like that. And that kind of muddled with what was happening and would confuse me at times. But still, this book, fantastic. And now, we're getting to the worst of the worst. You know what it is. <laughs> The worst book of 2020 was Kafka on the freaking shore. I hate this book. I have never hated a book before. I've disliked books. I thought they were terrible. This book actively makes me mad. It started out beautiful. I was loving it. Then it betrayed me. So first off, it's magical realism. Ah, this book made me realize I hate magical realism. But what's this mess about? Okay, we have this boy Kafka. Kafka ever since from a young age, he knew he had to run away from home. He just wasn't meshing well with his dad. He has this alter ego kid in his head, maybe. Or maybe he's actually there. I don't know. His name is Crow. Crow is like there urging him on like, yes, yes, you need to be the toughest 15 year old on the planet. You need to hurry up and get out of this house. So Kafka runs away. He runs into this small town eventually gets a job at like a library. He meets some great people. My favorite was Nakata until the book ruined him. And then just a bunch of nonsense happens. So apparently magical realism is where you can get away with absolute nonsense happening and it's cool jazz. Like, oh, fish raining from the sky. Why? Oh, he's just so cool. That guy's tearing the hearts out of cats. Why? To build a flute. For what? It's amazing. You, my friend, you're on a journey to deliver this stone to a special gateway of some sort. But you cannot, because you must go have sex with this prostitute first. I don't want to. Why? As I said so, you look like you need a break. I was not making that up. Colonel Sanders, in this book, orders a man to go have sex with a prostitute. Does it further the story in any way? No. It just happens. And we have to watch it. The dude who did the duty. He comes back to Colonel Sanders. You heard me right. Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken. He's in this book. For some reason. He's like, ugh. Oh, oh. So I enjoyed that, but why? And Mr. Kentucky Fried Chicken's like, all you know just to make you really happy before we have to go deliver the fancy rock to the fancy gateway. My big question in all this is why? It really makes me mad that people call this a modern classic. Let me read you how Mr. Murakami tries to bullcrap his way out of this book trying to tell us why he wrote it and what you obviously should have realized while reading it. Kafka on the shore contains several riddles, but there aren't any solutions provided. Instead, several of these riddles combine, and through their interaction, the possibility of a solution takes shape. Possibility of a solution. And the form this solution takes will be different for each reader. To put it another way, the riddles function as part of the solution. It's hard to explain, but that's the kind of novel I set out to write. It's hard to explain, that is the novel you did write, sir. Do you know what scene, what movie scene comes into my mind when I think about this book? The syndrome scene from The Incredibles. And when everyone's super... <laughs> <laughs> no one will be. <laughs> if everyone is super, no one will be. If this is literally a metaphor and a riddle for everything, because the great subject of metaphors is taught prevalently throughout this book, and if everything is a metaphor, nothing is, because everybody can take everything they want out of it, and if it's not really anything, there's nothing holding up the structure of the book. Like, the plot's all over the place. Our character Kafka degrades rapidly. He literally disgusts me. Because you want to know why our guy did not get along with his dad? Daddy was apparently like, hey son, I hate your guts. So I'm going to curse you. You know our friend Oedipus. He had a baby with a mommy. His own mommy. You know. You, you gonna do the same thing. But not only with mommy. With sissy too. And Kafka's like, no. At first. Then he meets a girl. And you know. 
Paka was young when his sister and his mother left him, so he has no idea who or what they look like. So Kafka meets this girl and he's like, oh, like, I really, like, you're, you're such a fun person. Like, I, I wish you were my sister. Maybe you are my sister. That girl was ridiculous all on her own. Like, they were in her apartment together and they were talking and she's like, oh, I have a boyfriend. I have a boyfriend. Well, give me your penis and I'll give you a hand job. Then, now we gotta deal with mommy. Kafka bonds with this woman who is heavily hinted at at being his mommy. And he does it. He does it. He does it. And I had to watch. I hate this boy. I hate this book. Magical realism is just so pretentious to me. It's all about the imagery and about none of the characters, the plots, anything. It's nonsensical. It's scattered. It's all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason. You know like a good story arc? No, this is a story spaghetti. It is blah, 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 everywhere. I honestly hate this book. And if book burnings were not looked down upon, I would have set this thing on fire a long time ago. We need to take a break. I feel like we need to take a break. Just break on me. I am never going to read a book of his ever again. He has just scarred me for life. But now, it's time to talk about the best thing that happened to me this year. It is time to just bring in that book that unleashed a dark gate locking up my dark heart nestled deep within the dark recesses of my dark soul. A book that just had me ripping it, white knuckling the pages in constant amazement. Just how mean an author could be. This is time for the great new love of my life. Lost Boy by Christina Henry. This was the best book I read in 2020. It was no contest after I read it that nothing would topple this book. It is so short, which is the only bad thing about it. If you guys don't know, this is an insanely dark retelling of Peter Pan. Our main character is Jamie, who will later grow up to be James Hook. Captain Hook, but he's not an adult now. He's a little boy and he's Peter Pan's right-hand man, second in command, and his best friend. Like Peter and he, they're inseparable, but Peter is a flying jerk face. He is literally everything about my greedy childhood wishes bundled up into super-powered angst. He is what would happen if you gave a child, an entitled spoiled child, every magical ability under the sun. If he wants to play, you have to play with him now. You're on his island you listen to his rules and his sense of fun the games that he plays are insanely dangerous to these little human boys that he goes out into the world outside of Neverland and, and collects for his own like sense of being a leader and wanting to have play things and play mates at the same time and does Peter get attached to any of these boys besides Jamie no, these kids die regularly because Peter thinks it's a great idea to go swimming with crocodiles. They die all the time. And then he just goes out and gets some more. And then Jamie, he's starting to realize this is bad. So now Jamie has some decisions to make. He could either let it keep happening as Peter's favorite. He could try to persuade Peter to keep like, to keep Jamie, but let all the other boys go. Or he could maybe try to kill Peter and let the other boys go free. It's very conflicted and it was beautiful. <clears throat> if my TBR for January was not already packed to the gills, I would slap this bad boy on there. The instant I finished it, I wanted to reread it. And y'all, there's a deeper reason why I love this insanely dark book. It gave me permission as an author to ruin my character's lives. This book does not have a happy ending, and I never knew how much I wanted that. You mean the boy doesn't have to get the girl? No, no, no. You mean not everyone has to walk out with all their limbs attached? No, not at all. Not even their heads? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the world is going to burn beneath my fingers. I will write the terrible tragedy. Prose will wither. Ink will dry out. In the blaze of the creation I have planned for all those characters trapped inside the recesses of my brain. This book was an inspiration to be terrible to my future book characters. Ooh. I salute you, Christina. Even though you wrote the awful ghost tree, this book was beautiful and I cannot wait to pick it up again. And that's it, guys. We have a whole other year to look forward to. New year of reading, but we're not done with 2020 yet. We gotta talk about the best and worst male characters, the best and worst female characters, the best and worst villains. They're all coming at you soon, so watch out and stay reading, my friends.